Any questions, no time, he's in charge. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow, isn't it? Um, kia ora tato. My name's Keith Broom. I'm with the Department of Conservation in New Zealand, and I'm chairing this next session, which is uh, a subject dear to my heart, um, and that is uh, island biosecurity. And to uh, start us off and set the scene for us, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr Ewan Kennedy. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, Keith, incidentally, as you can see behind me, is the co-author of this paper. Uh, when I speak in the first person, I often mean we. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed, Tony, and the rest of your team for the invitation to introduce the theme of biosecurity at this conference. In, in fact, I think we've come late to the party. It's really gratifying to see the extent to which biosecurity has already muscled its way into the program. And I'm reassured too by the extent to which earlier speakers have already conveyed most of my messages. Well, I, I hardly need remind an audience like this of biosecurity's importance for island restoration. And I hope I don't startle you uh, by arguing that it's actually the most important consideration, since it's the pest-free condition of an island which gives every other restoration activity its purpose and meaning. So including biosecurity at conferences of this kind can only be highly advantageous to our collective interests. That said, I've lost my pointer. <coughs> that, that said, I'm very conscious of addressing a conference here of seasoned eradication warriors with uh, quite audacious credentials in your trade. You're a particularly formidable class of conservation Jesuit. And I, I confess that my own credentials in your business are a little dated now. I acquired those through a project long ago, a pioneering project, which frankly prevailed more through bloody-mindedness than know-how, and is by today's standards a lesson in how not to go about eliminating pests from an island. Um, but that's a wrenching story for another day. There is, of course, a great deal in common between your eradication work and biosecurities. Above all, our two lines of labour spring from the same commanding imperative. So we are both kindred spirits and the two mutually dependent parts of the pest-free equation. Your job is to get the pests off islands, my job is to keep them off in perpetuity. So as I see it, uh, it's ultimately my job to put you out of business. Uh, I, I wish. Well, we don't always have an easy or a seamless working relationship, do we? In New Zealand, folk, folk like me are rightly exasperated when eradication planners treat biosecurity as an operational afterthought. Eradication teams are rightly exasperated at having to do their job twice or more often because of biosecurity failures. So before we proceed much further, let's get some truths on the table about our relationship. For those of us on the biosecurity side of the pest-free equation, these principles are unimpeachable. First, eradication invest investments will come to nothing without confident biosecurity already in place or assured. So there are two questions to be asked at the outset of planning. Is it feasible to eradicate the pest organism, but also can the island be defended realistically from reinfestation? Well, these two truths argue that biosecurity should be the cornerstone of any eradication project, not the last brick in the wall, not something we'll work on later. Some more truths. If it's not well prepared at the outset, then biosecurity is likely to be done poorly in the aftermath. Given its uh, technical, social and economic complexities, it will take longer than you expect to get secure arrangements in place. Expect long lead times. And managing those same complexities over biosecurity's very different horizons and time frames requires its own class of specialist. Eradication warriors may be the right stuff, 
but don't count on it. So you see, we can be Jesuits too. These are hard truths because they oblige us to do some very hard biosecurity work right up front at the start. And that's awkward when eradication planning is already all consuming. Now, if you'd like to talk to someone um, about an example of a project that got it pretty much right, talk to Stephen Horn. Is he here in the audience? The Antipodes project did a, made a pretty good fist of getting it right. To these principles, we'd add another, the uber truth. Of the three defining classes of biosecurity work, pre-border quarantine, post-border vigilance, and swift lethal responses to new pest arrivals, quarantine is strategically and tactically the best investment full stop. It puts biosecurity firmly on the front foot where it simply must be. Well, what you see here uh, is an instruction to attend pragmatically to biosecurity as an indivisible part of eradication work and all that follows. In return, it's the duty of biosecurity specialists to make good on this instruction by being on top of what we have to do. I want to use this presentation then to explain to you what we in New Zealand's Department of Conservation, DOC, are doing to lift our biosecurity game. I'll explore some confronting issues which currently limit our reach and effect as an operational partner. And we'll finish by looking at efforts we're making to address these issues. Now, the context may be different for you, but I'm hoping that the lessons are the same. Why focus on these obstacles? Well, because if we do not overcome them, uh, biosecurity will continue to lack the maturity and stamina of its uh, eradication twin, um, and it will act as a break on our collective ambitions. Some brief context. Today, DOC has biosecurity obligations to more than 400 pest-free islands, pest-sensitive islands, greater than two hectares in area in the New Zealand archipelago. Many have been cleared at extraordinary expense, but others have never been invaded. This inventory of sanctuaries and proto-sanctuaries, that is sanctuaries in the making, ranges in tenure from fully private to fully public land. It extends from the Kermit X in the subtropics to Campbell Island in the deep sub-Antarctic. Sanctuaries at the extremities are generally well protected by their isolation and very strict rules on access. But as you expect, those closer to mainland New Zealand are within easier reach of humans and pest organisms. It's not unusual at home for accessible pest-free islands to be open sanctuaries. That is, the public may visit and camp uh, there as they wish and by any means. In fact, DOC itself uh, it encourages visitors through energetic public evangelism. For, for uh, biosecurity people, the evangelism is too energetic because such uncontrolled destinations, as you know, are the stuff of nightmares. About 65 uh, of DOC's 2,000 staff, um, or should I say, sadly, only 65 of DOC's 2,000 staff, include biosecurity among the many calls on their operational time. We're all supported, however, by our eradication veterans on DOC's Island Eradication Advisory Group. Indeed, those veterans act as our conscience, our critic, and our confidant. Well, ba back in 2013, Keith um, reported on a, uh, who chairs the IAG, reported on a penetrating critique of DOC's biosecurity practices, its mindsets, and its capacity. Uh, his review revealed that in too many parts of our organisation, complacency and ad hocracy were alive and well. Now, we know these to be the familiar enemies of good practice. As a result, though, DOC was hemorrhaging hundreds of thousands of dollars on responses to pest incursions resulting from negligence. Now, I'm not talking here about incursions where the pests themselves made their own way to our islands, though, in truth, we were underprepared for those too. Uh, in part because we underestimated the swimming abilities of the invaders, and we're still being surprised, um, and, or hadn't foreseen how difficult detection and capture would be. In 2014, DOC adopted Keith's recommendations for change and launched a project of national priority uh, to radically improve its biosecurity functions. 
Now this is first and foremost about getting Doc's house in order so that we ourselves do not jeopardise pest-free islands through our own very frequent traffic to them. And given some of the places we work in, we're a fertile source of contamination. Internally, we are now hell-bent on normalising a vital biosecurity culture in all corners of our organisation. Um, to the extent where we're arguing internally uh, for functional priority for DOC, um, equivalent to firefighting and health and safety with all the associated prerogatives and resources. And we're also working hard to upgrade our tools, our methods um, and our capacity. Um, so here are just some of the things that we're doing. Two specialist advisors have been appointed to drive the, the improvements nationwide. These are extraordinary roles for DOC. We don't see them very often and they signal serious intent to make good. We've created three networks of biosecurity practitioners and are using these quite deliberately to negotiate standards collectively and to migrate or socialise knowledge across fragmenting institutional barriers, internally that is. A fully declared imperative is to build a strong biosecurity collegiate for all, uh, to invoke for our work all the powerful unifying benefits of collegial interaction. Now, the older amongst you will recognise this as good old-fashioned stuff. It, um, it, it, it amounts to putting the thinking operator back into work otherwise governed by secularising systems, SOPs and processes. But it allows us to increase our capacity um, by, um, um, without having to increase the number of ranges. We just make them work more productively. Thanks to a formative partnership with New Zealand's Kiwi Bank, we are seeing an unprecedented expansion in our pest detection dog program. More handlers, more dogs, trained to detect more types of organisms and more intensive coverage nationwide. We're preparing to update best practice prescriptions for all aspects of our work. These will be living prescriptions amended as we learn. Um, and since our blood under the fingernails practitioners take to writing like ducks to concrete, we are experimenting with simpler, more pragmatic forms of biosecurity plan. We've adopted the Coordinated Incident Management System, SIMS, internationally recognised system for managing crises, as our standard mode of response to incursions. This is giving us the assurance of swift, well-supported, appropriately targeted responses on the ground, guided by the best knowledge we have. Local rangers are no longer left to muddle their way through a response. And we make a point of apprenticing our novices to uh, SIMS teams on the job. We want to refit or replace our 40 plus quarantine facilities nationwide over the next 10 years. These secure stores are a primary pivot point for our biosecurity operations um, and uh, for all of our island operations and uh, its public face too and we're resuming systematic audits of local biosecurity practices and culture. Now these are peer reviews, neighbours review neighbours. Um, and we find this to be a highly constructive way of negotiating standards and sustaining them in our biosecurity community. Well, th there's a lot more I'd love to tell you about these um, and other lines of improvement. But right now I want to look at some of the more disconcerting challenges we've encountered along the way. Some of these, frankly, we should have expected, others ambushed us. In the main, they relate to biosecurity's sprawling social dimensions. And this is hairy dragons country for most of us. Unlike your eradication specialists, we cannot avoid working with humans, the most idiosyncratic organism on the planet. And unlike you, we're not allowed to liquidate our, our target audience. We, we have two broad classes of human to deal with. Um, our own colleagues and the public whose contact with our islands is considerably more diverse and problematic. Of the two, uh, I wonder if you can guess which, the worst, we find that the worst offenders, the ones more resistant to biosecurity, are our colleagues. They reason that as conservation specialists, they can judge how much they need to comply with the rules. They can judge the risks. Well, this is so frustrating. 
This is the expert mindset at work. It translates biosecurity from an essential good into an irritating necessity. Moreover, our recalcitrants frequently argue that there's little point in them submitting themselves to quarantine checks when the public can visit the same islands without doing so. And this has resulted in quite disabling pressure internally to reduce quarantine standards. Well, how do we defeat this dismal reasoning? Um, we use a different logic. Biosecurity, we say, can only minimise the risks, not extinguish them altogether. So if some of an island's visitors are guaranteed pest-free, then the risk is reduced accordingly. But two other features of biosecurity compound our problems with resistance internally. We all know this in our waters. Biosecurity has an image problem. When, when everything works as it should, nothing happens. And unlike your heroic eradication work, it's much less glamorous, more open-ended, um, and not so dramatically rewarded. Reputations are simply not made in this business as they are in yours. So we have to find really creative ways to increase its appeal. I'm really drawn to Tony's evocative slow motion filmmaking. <laughs> I've got an idea there. Second, intercepting very little year after year may be wildly exciting for us, but for resource stressed, goal directed colleagues, nil results argue for shifting effort from biosecurity to other more obviously productive work. We find then that our colleagues are inclined to treat biosecurity as an insurance policy on which it's safe to avoid paying the premiums. We're in a, a, a better position to legislate compliance in this captive audience. And we, do, we are doing that through rules which apply universally to all dock staff our, uh, and to our associates and to all our freight. Our gatekeepers, for instance, are mandated to refuse travel to islands for people who don't comply with the standards. But actually, we need to do better than this. We need to normalise biosecurity as a way of acting by playing more cleverly on our innate human instinct to conform to peer pressure. Peer pressure is our most powerful tool for, be for durable, beneficial change. How we convert peer pressure not to comply to willing participation will have much in common with how we address the fraught problems of invoking the right behaviour in the uninitiated public. And this is the area in which biosecurity at home is faltering most conspicuously. We are seriously underinvested here, most obviously because we've not been very quick to trust or use the tools of social psychology. So we lack certainty on how to bring behaviour change about and this is making us very vulnerable. Take for instance Great Mercury Island, whose owners welcome public visitors as you can see. Rodents and cats were eradicated, oh sorry, I beg your pardon. Rodents and cats were eradicated in 2014 at a cost of $1.5 million. Three years later, there are good biosecurity, sorry, good surveillance and response measures in place, but no coherent quarantine strategy to minimise the many forms of visitor risk. What we see here is an all too common emphasis on surveillance and response. This is more comfortable technical ground for those of us unskilled in modifying human behaviour. Unfortunately, neglecting quarantine because of its social complexities denies us a powerful range of interventions and results, and this is a key message, results in biosecurity which is inherently reactive and therefore dangerously off balance. What do we do? Well, <coughs> normally we fall back on conventional messaging to fill the vacuum. Typically our signage is a mix of prohibitions and appeals to protect natural values. We're learning now, however, that this will not do the job for us. It probably never has. Much of it amounts to shouting at our audiences. Branding, <coughs> branding is similarly problematic. Auckland Council and DOC launched this brand to talk to the hundreds of thousands of visitors to islands in the Hauraki Gulf Maritime Park. You could find the branding on everything from billboards to bait stations. Surveys of brand awareness showed, however, that its shotgun blasts of information simply didn't work well enough. 
this second um, information light version is in, on, under trial now, but we still don't know whether it, it has any effect. Clearly, we need social research to determine which messages will prompt visitors to become willing biosecurity actors, say, to conduct their own quarantine intuitively <coughs> before departure. Social researchers tell us already that those messages will resonate with audiences' own reasons for visiting islands, not with ours. We'll need some research help too where we are able to do quarantine checks on visitors. For example, here on Machu Soames Island, just a few minutes from downtown Wellington City. Here we face examples of rather more cryptic psychological barriers to the biosecurity habit. First, credibility. The public simply do not believe that they have a mouse in their bag when we ask them to empty the contents and check. How many of you have said they've got to be serious when asked to do the same? Well, this is an, an important collision point between public sentiment and biosecurity. It's the point at which biosecurity sanity and legitimacy is being questioned. Second, winning the contest for credibility is made more difficult in that emptying bags and pockets in the company of strangers can be quite socially awkward. Well, uh, we could carry on in this vein forever and drive ourselves to the edge of the, the abyss. Um, and I'm sure we commit many other um, unwitting social offences in the name of biosecurity. And the remedies all seem intractable to those of us who are intuitively gun-shy of social research and its arcane science. But given terrifying sights like this, this is this no damn time to be squeamish. I want to finish then by telling you very briefly about how we've begun to confront some of these challenges. First, we recognise that managing biosecurity's social dimensions requires the right kind of operator. Not all field ecologists have the necessary manner or motivations, and quite frankly some of us should never be allowed near the public at all. <laughs> we have learned the important principle, the very important principle, that our colleagues and public alike must see for themselves before they'll accept the improbable. So we must replace talking with videos, photos, eyewitnesses, evidence, above all evidence, and stories. And a liberating behaviour change of our own. Uh, we're learning to, be, to approach this work reflexively, to, to be suspicious of the assumptions we make about our audiences. Here's a simple example. When we ask them to check for pests in their gear, what do they think a pest is? Come to think of it, what do they think check means? And we are sexing this show up by using our pest detection dogs as ambassadors and champions. They do this way better than anyone else. And no matter what the media or the audience, our dogs can convey all our messages instantaneously by their presence and in the wag of a tail. We've commenced two qualitative social research projects designed to find ways of stimulating beneficial behaviour in, in island visitors. Both studies are using community-based social marketing method in one way or another. The first aims to convince recreational boat users to leave their pet dogs at home. Dogs landed from boats are killing endangered kiwis on island sanctuaries in New Zealand's far north. Incidentally, this study's findings so far on what prompted boat owners to bring their dogs out on the water in the first place and then put them ashore to do a dump um, have confounded most of our assumptions about this target audience and what would work to change their behaviour. And if we have time, I'd love to tell you what some of those findings were. Our second study aims to persuade recreational boat users. I'm sorry, if I've got my act together, I would have given you something more pleasant to look at, but <laughs> this is the penultimate slide. Our second study aims to persuade recreational boat users to check their vessels and their gear before, for pests before they leave home, in the driveway, before they, they turn the ignition switch. We assume, there's another assumption, that they'll feel more comfortable about checking at home than in the high-pressure, testosterone-enriched environment of the launch ramp. 
and we see immediate value in turning the social research blowtorch on our own colleagues to determine their barriers to good biosecurity practice, a key target audience. Well, these are small steps and we're not going to engineer a paradigm shift just yet. We have many other questions and audiences to investigate and we will not arrive easily at the answers. But another key message for you, this is where biosecurity has to go for its proper reach and balance. What about the future then? We recognise the need for a more systematic programme of social investment, much like the improvement project that we have in train now. Both have a tremendous appetite for creativity and that's enormously appealing. Uh, I'm also drawn um, to Greg's proposals for uh, global connectedness over eradication work. Biosecurity lends itself to exactly the same approach. There's no doubt in our minds of the value in a biosecurity equivalent of the IEAG, the Island Eradication Advisory Group, to be the keeper of biosecurity's conscience and standards. Working in parallel with the IEAG to check biosecurity's operational readiness, such an authority would be outstanding preparation for a future in which the formidable social challenges of eradicating pests from populated islands and keeping those pests off will demand very much more sophisticated tools and thinking than we possess now. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we started a little late, so we'll just uh, roll right on there. If you've got questions for you, and um, there's still time to uh, catch them in the breaks. Now I want to introduce uh, Professor Mike Richardson, who's going to pick up on a theme that uh, uh, Tony Martin alluded to uh, in his great presentation on the uh, South Georgia uh, eradication. Um, and Mike's talking about the uh, post-eradication uh, biosecurity on South Georgia. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Keith. Um, this is a joint presentation between myself and John Croxall. Both John and I are uh, long-standing trustees of the South Georgia uh, Heritage Trust. In this talk, we, we want to look at uh, specifically to examine what biosecurity lessons uh, uh, have been learned from the South Georgia project and what is now needed to prevent uh, reinvasion of rodents. Well, tentative plans for eradication on South Georgia go back to about 2000. However, it was not until 2009-10 that things really got underway with serious progress now being made. And it unfolded thereafter, as Tony so ably described to us on Monday evening, with three phases of baiting, each at two-year intervals. Well, over the years, and I mentioned the steering committee there, over the years, a considerable amount of documentation uh, was uh, submitted to the regulatory authority, which in this case is the government of South Georgia. One aspect addressed in detail was biosecurity, with a biosecurity plan submitted for each of those eradication phases. But those plans addressed biosecurity solely in relation to the nuts and bolts of the project. In other words, uh, the importation into South Georgia of materials needed for the project, or the movement of equipment, including helicopters, from one part of South Georgia to another. What we as a steering committee, and incidentally it didn't just consist of South Georgia Heritage Trust uh, representatives, but also representatives of government and British Antarctic Survey and so on, what we failed collectively to do was to look at the much wider issue of biosecurity in parallel to eradication. And yet the crucial need uh, to address that overarching biosecurity um, requirement had been well recognized back in 2007. And indeed, this highly pertinent uh, statement incidentally came from the South Georgia government. Well, despite this uh, failing on biosecurity, we appeared to be making good progress. 
and by mid-2014, uh, we had reached this stage. We were optimistic. Uh, things appeared to be looking good. But that optimism was somewhat shattered in late October of 2014. There were the unmistakable signs of a rat in newly fallen snow at King Edward Point, KEP, the main administrative centre of South Georgia, and in fact right in the heart of the phase one baiting area. Well, was this a survivor from the 2011 baiting phase? Uh, it seemed most unlikely. This is the most inhabited part of South Georgia, and there have been no signs of rodents in the preceding three and a half years. Could it have been imported from another part of South Georgia, yet to be baited? Well, this was not impossible, but it seemed uh, most implausible. Instead, the most, Im most probable conduit for this invasive was from a vessel recently tied up at the nearby KEP jetty. And indeed, there had been, sorry, I missed that. And indeed, there had been such uh, vessels. One governmental vessel had visited uh, the, the, the jetty a number of times between the 5th and the 22nd of October. Another governmental vessel, uh, in fact, had arrived on the 22nd and was still, in fact, alongside at the time of the incident. So the prevailing view of the steering committee uh, was that this was indeed the most probable uh, route for this invasive rat. And that view was, in fact, in reinforced by government, though, as you can see, uh, there was the obvious caveat. Well, proof or no proof, one might have thought that this one incident alone would have immediately triggered a major governmental-led review of biosecurity, with much more robust uh, measures being rapidly put in place. Well, in reality, this proved uh, not to be the case. Whatever, it was mid-2015, in other words, eight months later, before the wider issue of biosecurity resurfaced, with government requesting, now with some considerable urgency, uh, that uh, SGHT's input to the apparent major review of uh, biosecurity that government was uh, carrying out. The Trust responded. By late July, we had submitted a series of 10 recommendations. Sorry, I've jumped. Some of these were rather obvious, such as the need for effective rat guards on ships. And, and indeed, even now, there is a problem, a physical problem of rat guards capable withstanding the uh, severe weather conditions in South Georgia. Another was the need to maintain an adequate supply of brodificum bait at KEP. We suggested about three tons of in-date uh, bait. Our more substantive recommendations were, however, fourfold. They're here. Um, rodent detection dogs have been uh, used widely for many years in New Zealand, and they are now used routinely on Macquarie, on all vessels going to that island. Two of these recommendations, the middle two there, are designed to prevent the wider escape into the environment of any rodent that does make it ashore. And the last, the most likely source of an invasive, needs, in our view, much, much tighter regulation. Well, the Trust expected that uh, its views would be fed rapidly into a new biosecurity plan. Uh, we were, unfortunately, mistaken. Instead, the biosecurity handbook published by government in December of 2015 was, by their own admission, no more than a statement of the status quo. It took no account of the more substantive of SGHT's recommendations, themselves based on international best practice. Well, we believed then, and we continue to believe, that our proposals are both practical and feasible. They do, however, come with costs, alternative risks, potential liability, and the need for specific uh, design considerations to meet South Georgia's very harsh conditions. But it's worth contrasting the respective costs of eradication and biosecurity. The investment in the eradication uh, project by SGHT, and you have to realize that over 80% of the costs were raised by sponsorship and charitable donations. Those costs were very considerable, with direct costs of about seven and a half million pounds, and if one factors in the indirect costs, we're going up towards 10 million. Our ballpark estimate, it is no more than estimate, for the package of substantive biosecurity measures uh, is in contrast a fraction of that totaling about half a million pounds. 
SGHT very much endorses government's philosophy over biosecurity as set out in this statement. And that concept, again from 2007, features, though less explicitly, in subsequent biosecurity policy documents from government. Nevertheless, a decade later, in the most recent policy document from government, which incidentally appeared about three weeks ago, pre-border biosecurity measures in relation to rodents rely largely on the use of rat guards, requiring rodent bait stations to be carried on board vessels, and the use of bait stations within shipping containers. But even these measures are unlikely, in our view, to be sufficiently effective. Well, a variety of vessels uh, visit South Georgia. The commonest are fishing, tourist, and governmental vessels. The largest can be up to 40,000 gross tons. The general requirement is for all vessels to have at least two bait boxes on board to be checked before entering South Georgia waters. Well, I show this vessel simply to demonstrate the scale of the issue. There's no suggestion that this particular vessel, which incidentally is one of the BAS British Antarctic Survey research vessels, is anything other than rodent-free uh, rodent and, dare I say it, squeaky clean. But there could be a myriad of spaces within a vessel of even this modest size, never mind one, never mind one seven times larger, uh, and in that context one could question whether just two bait boxes on board are adequate to check for rodents. On a 40,000 tonne vessel, even more so. What needs to be remembered is that the lone rat of October 2014 had circumvented shipboard measures and the numerous traps um, and bait boxes around KEP. I think I've missed that. In other words, those provisions, those biosecurity provisions at that time had failed. In its five-year strategy document for 2016 through to 2020, government set out its aspirations as follows. Well, amongst these uh, yardsticks and the fact that best practice can be readily found elsewhere, for example, on Macquarie, what actions have been taken with regard to SGHT's more substantive recommendations? And to date, unfortunately, one has to say that none has yet been implemented. However, as of 15 June, very recently, and on a much more positive note, we understand that government is now exploring, and I underline that word, th these three issues. It has taken repeated approaches from a government by SGHT on biosecurity with other NGOs, including highly influential UK-based organisations, more recently adding their voice to get this far. Well, biosecurity is not just about uh, adequate measures being put in place, but crucially, it is also about the timing of implementation of those measures. So, even if these provisions uh, are, are fully in place, for some of them, it will be not far short of a decade since this part of South Georgia was baited in phase one of the eradication pro program. In summary, Despite the apparent success of the world's largest island rodent eradication project on South Georgia, there have been failings from which lessons need to be learnt. And here I would include criticism of our steering committee collectively. The title of this talk is Post-Eradication Biosecurity because that is largely where we have been. But that title is somewhat erroneous. For in reality, biosecurity and eradication need to go hand in hand. Biosecurity needs to be in place not after eradication, but rather at or preferably before its initiation. There needs to be close synergy between the two. And this is particularly so when two organizations, perhaps of very contrasting uh, status, are involved, as has been the case on South Georgia. To achieve that synergy, we recommend uh, an agreement or an accord be put in place to set out the respective obligations of those responsible for the biosecurity and eradication elements. We need to get away from the fact that enhanced biosecurity is only put in place after the completion of eradication. Without such an agreement, as I've just mentioned, the elements of eradication and biosecurity may well, as in the, South, the case of South Georgia, get out of step, either in their timing, their effectiveness, or both. The last thing we need is to return to the status quo ante with the inevitable detriment 
to the envir island's environment. Lastly, were rodents uh, ever to gain a real toehold on South Georgia again, it is very doubtful, uh, given the dramatic changes in, for example, the, the glaciers on the island, whether the sort of eradication uh, campaign that was mounted over that five-year period could be repeated. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Dr. Jill Key, and uh, Jill's going to tell us about island biosecurity in St. Helena. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm wearing a different hat. Um, thank you. This time I'm now giving a talk on behalf of the St. Helena government and three colleagues who can't be here because the island is too remote to have allowed them to travel for the conference. So, as they say on the T-shirts on the island, where the hell is St. Helena? Um, you've seen lots of little fly specks at the bottom of the South Atlantic. Here's another one. Um, St. Helena is a very small island. It's 10 miles by 5, 47 square miles. It's 1,200 miles in South Africa. And it's got a population of 4,500. So, it's a tiny little place. And, of course, that isolation has served it very well as a barrier. Um, it's got very high biodiversity. There's a third percent endemism, mostly invertebrates. Um, and from the biosecurity perspective, of course, there's very limited vectors coming in in a single pathway because there is only one supply vessel, which is this one, half cargo, half passengers. It visits about 25 times a year between Cape Town, 1,200 miles away, five nights, and Ascension Island, two or three nights, 700 miles away in the other direction. And, of course, this serves as a kind of quarantine period for uh, a lot of goods and commodities on the ship. Now, back in 2010, the UK government announced that they were going to build an airstrip, an airport. Um, this was finally opened this year, although we still don't have commercial flights. And it is, of course, a new pathway to the island for the first time. There's actually two new pathways. Um, there are projected to be weekly flights from probably tropical West Africa, possibly Europe with stops in tropical West Africa, a lovely place to pick up some nice malaria for mosquitoes. And, of course, the construction phase means bringing in vast quantities of commodities. And the second pathway is a second dedicated ship, which for the first time, a special wharf was built, touches the island and vehicles can drive on and off. The standard supply ship anchors one nautical mile offshore. So we've actually got two separate um, new pathways. A lot of overseas construction workers arrived, including nearly 100 specialist Thai workers. A massive cultural shock to the island. Um, and the top photograph shows the table in the customs hall of goods that were taken off the first group of just over 20 Thai workers as they turned up to start work. Um, leaves, seeds, stones, rocks, pebbles, cooked food that they obviously took from their home eight days before that's been rotting in their hold luggage ever since. They had no idea where they were going. So massive cultural shock. So what did we do? Um, there was a four-year UK government-funded project to strengthen biosecurity in anticipation of air access. Um, I did a little status of the situation in 2013 to see where the main gaps were. And one of the main parts of this was a whole series of stakeholder consultations. What does the island think about the existing system? We found extensive support. In fact, nobody actually was against it, despite some very constructive criticisms about how it was run. Nobody really understood what biosecurity meant as a word. But they did understand border security because they all watched the Australian program on television on Sunday nights. So we branded ourselves border security for a year before we moved on to biosecurity and had a massive communications um, campaign. We had a big workshop with the stakeholders. We defined the vision. A lot of process. It took 14 months to produce a very simple document. Draft strategies, consultation, going up to government. Um, a lot of invitations of people come to the wharf, see what we do, see what happens down when the fruit and veg comes in and we have to check it, um, schools. Um, and by the end of that, we got enormous support for the national policy. But the most important thing is we took 14 months to write an eight-page document because 
Lord Howe Island situation, if you were that presentation, um, without even knowing about we avoided the problem of not taking the community with us. So we've established the national framework. The strategy was endorsed in 2014. Um, and there was a massive biosecurity upgrade going on at the same time. Um, there is a whitelist approach endorsed on the island. Everything is banned except what is on the list. There are import health standards, there's 12 of them written to define how things can come in from live animals to fruit and veg to plant propagating material to sand to compost, everything. A licensing system for certain commodities defining pre-border treatments. Everything is raised to international standards as far as we can. Um, and it is implemented across the continuum. One of the main things that we found in 2013 was the border wasn't too bad because there's a very strong customs operation and we can kind of hitch with that. But post-border, there was nothing. So now there is quite a strong post-border system. Pheromone trapping for um, tephritted fruit flies, our high-risk species, um, insect monitoring devices. And we spent some time surveying shipping containers and vehicles to determine the risk and have set up a inspection um, protocol and procedures for imported shipping containers and vehicles. Um, so that was all very, very um, useful. Capacity has been raised across the board. Um, in 2013, there were no full-time biosecurity officers. The system was run by the pest control officer who left her office once every three weeks to lead an inspection team down on the wharf, trained inspectors who were the pest control uh, sprayers, the biocontrol team, four people that were trained but doing other jobs. For the first time, two full-time biosecurity officers were recruited. They were trained. Uh, Harriet, the chocolate Labrador, has been recruited and trained, so she works down there with the team. An enormous amount of publicity has been put back onto the island about how they work, and this is one of the most important things we learned. The ship comes in, they inspect the fruit and veg, off it goes. Nobody knows it's happening normally, so on the community radio, ship arrived today, four tons of fruit was landed, 30 different varieties, it took us three hours, nothing was found, or a caterpillar was found, or a lot of information fed back to the community, this is what we're doing for you. Um, we upgraded facilities at the wharf, we've made sure facilities are there at the airport, and customs and immigration are part of the ex extended biosecurity team. Both our biosecurity officers have been trained up as warranted customs officers, so they can help each other. Everybody is short-staffed, customs work for biosecurity, biosecurity works for customs, they can help each other. So a lot of training across the board. Um, and one thing that we devoted a fair bit of time to was building up the baseline and reference collection. Because at the border, you're looking for new things that you've probably never seen before, don't know what they look like. Something turns up, have we already got it? You've got to, you've got to have some idea or access to expertise to help you. And that's where the Ferra Identification Service here in the UK helps us. But a lot of effort lead it, linking in with Darwin Plus projects to build up baseline. Okay, now this has been kind of mentioned before. How do you know how well you're doing? The classic biosecurity indicator is levels of interceptions, how many interceptions you get. And the idea is that the fewer you get, then the better you're doing. But if you're reporting zeros, your bosses aren't very impressed with you because you're not demonstrating you're doing anything. And the easiest way to achieve a zero is not to look. So that is a really poor indicator, but it, it's very hard to find appropriate indicators. After a lot of head scratching, we came up with a set of five indicators that we have established as thresholds to trigger investigation and action. It's not about how well or how not well we're doing. It's about saying, if you exceed the threshold, you stop and look to see why that might be. Have you changed your practices? Are new commodities coming in? It's a trigger for examination, and it gives us a lot of information we can report back up to our political masters because we're totally dependent on them keeping the funding going for those two officers. So we constantly have to prove to them we are working and earning our keep and finding things and saving the island and the food and the, the rainbows and tourism. And You constantly have to prove that. You need data. So database, simple indicators that we use as triggers to check that everything is working as it should be. Yes, we are working even harder. Yes, we are looking. 
So just an example of the kind of quantities that come in. This is 2016 data. We had 380 tons of fresh produce came in in about 530 different lots. That's varieties of things. Um, we have an inspection protocol based on international standards. The threshold is that 95% of those will not carry a quarantine pest. Um, and we are finding 97.4% do not carry a quarantine pest. So we're exceeding our threshold there. Uh, we had 15 interceptions. They're mostly fruit fly maggots and caterpillars in the fruit. Um, we've got nearly 4,000 passengers arriving on the single supply ship, on yachts, on cruise ships. That's eight cruise ships. About 180 yachts come in. 98% of them did not come in with a risk item. We, we took 469 items off 60 passengers. That's fruit. The commonest is picking apples and oranges out of the fruit bowl as you come off the ship. It's also shells. It's African um, ornaments with uh, webbing in them, stuff like that. We have 42 live animals came in. None of them were non-compliant. Everyone had the correct paperwork. Everyone passed the veterinary checks on the ship. So none of our thresholds have been exceeded, which is very, very encouraging. Extending the activities, having two full-time biosecurity officers, for the first time we could move away from just checking fruit and veg to looking at other things on the wharf and have a much bigger wharf presence. And in 2016, 1,023 shipping containers came in and 250 vehicles in brake bulk. There were other vehicles inside the shipping containers. We checked a certain proportion of these and two things stood out. 40% of the vehicles had compacted soil, particularly under the rear wheel arches. And we collected it all, we put it out, we tried to germinate stuff for up to three months. A lot of lawn grass appeared and the odd little weed, um, nothing major. Um, we picked up 98 live spiders of at least seven species from shipping containers inside the doors and the vehicles, particularly the gap behind the wing mirrors. All that has been fed back through the, um, the chain and we've now got protocols for checking these vehicles pre-border and all those um, incidences have really gone down. So very successful, lots of data and lots and lots of publicity. We found a lovely big fat brown widow spider on one of these things. Headlines in the local paper, we've saved you from spider invasion and death by, ch by spiders. Um, challenges. When you're living in a very small community of 4,500 people or less, it's very hard to stand there, open the suitcase, look at everybody's stuff, and take things off people. Um, St. Helena has strong customs, and so we're able to ride on the back of that, but it does present a challenge to the operators. You have to be very professional. The dog helps, and we have an x-ray scanner. It, it neutralizes inspection. You only open things where there is a reason to do that. You rely very, very heavily on public awareness and compliance. And this has been a huge success on St. Helena, thanks to the high integrity of the inspectors involved um, and the communications campaign that we've had and inviting people down to the wharf. That was very, very powerful. Um, we're still waiting for new legislation. Um, and it's very hard to know what risk, um, the uh, high-risk species are coming. We're hoping to do um, horizon scanning through the project that I mentioned earlier. This is a particular problem for us, risk assessment, when you don't have access to specialists. Um, and my peripheral vision tells me I'm about to get kicked off the podium. Uh, this is a very good model, biosecurity on a shoestring. Look at the paper, and thanks to all my colleagues in St. Helena and for yourselves for listening. Well, thanks, Jill. There's some, some great stuff there. Um, Next up is some more great stuff from uh, Mexico. This is uh, Mariam Latovska. Yeah. Who's uh, going to tell us about the uh, biosecurity program in Mexico? Thank you. Listos? Las islas son importantes sitios de anidación y crianza de aves marinas, así como atractivos turísticos por su gran belleza. Para su conservación, por favor, sigue estos sencillos consejos. No arrojes basura al mar ni en las islas. Revisa y empaca bien tus pertenencias en contenedores cerrados. Remueve tierra y semillas de maletas, ropa y zapatos. No lleves animales o plantas a las islas. No alteres a la fauna de las islas. Respeta sus espacios. Pasa la voz. Recuerda que las islas son de todos los mexicanos. ¡Cuídalas! 
La conservación de las islas está en nuestras manos. Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas AC. Las islas son... La bioseguridad insular... Just kidding, I'm switching to English now. Um, so the animation you just saw is part of our education and environmental learning campaign, and we do it through our social media. The term biosecurity is not very well known in Mexico. They usually also think it just has to do with borders and nothing to do with islands. And we are working to change that and to let people understand what biosecurity is and the prevention measures we should all follow through different types of outreach materials, such as leaflets, signage, radio spots, games, stickers, and other. With the slogan, La Conservación de las Islas está en nuestras manos, which translates to Island Conservation is in our hands, we strive to bring awareness of the problematics of invasive alien species to local communities. We use different approaches depending on our target audience, whether kids, youngsters, or adults. And all of our island restoration projects, which you've heard of from uh, my colleagues, have, are accompanied by a specifically designed environmental learning campaign that seeks to heighten uh, the sense of identity and priority of the island communities. We do know that just bringing awareness doesn't change um, habits, but we are first on, on the first step of just getting people to know what biosecurity is and how important islands are. So why is this important? You've probably seen this map before, but we are really proud of it, so I'm going to explain it again. Um, Mexico now has a successful trajectory on island restoration. So far, we have achieved the er eradication of 60 invasive populations of mammals from 39 islands. This represents around 59,000 hectares restored, and this has protected 147 endemic taxa of reptiles, birds, and plant species. It has also protected 227 highly vulnerable seabird colonies. We are now halfway through our goal of having all of Mexican islands free of invasive mammal species, which is a bold goal as we have committed to the Honolulu Challenge, which will be discussed later on this evening. And therefore, biosecurity is a priority and a transversal topic on all of our restoration projects. And so we want to keep these little green dots green and to have even more green dots on this map. So preventing introductions has become a, one of our priorities and we need to be more proactive on that aspect. So as a little background, in 2010, Mexico published its national strategy on invasive species. It has four axes, and the priority is biosecurity, building capacities. Uh, the second one is environmental learning and outreach. The, th the third is invasive alien species management and monitoring. What have we gained from all our investments? So in 2013, with funding from the Global Environment Facility through the United Nations Development Program, the Mexico's Commission for the Use and Knowledge of Biodiversity, the CONAVIO, started implementing the National Strategy on Invasive Species, emphasizing the building capacities part. Um, we, Conservación de Islas, are in charge of implementing the island chapter. It's also being implemented on protected areas on the mainland. So as I told you, we have environmental learning programs for all the islands where we work, but we chose six um, protected areas where we would work 
on biosecurity, on creating biosecurity protocols. You can see them here. They are all um, islands that have had previously eradicated invasive mammals and that we need the community support to keep them free of invasive species. Um, the first effort on building national capacities was made in 2014 when we held the first workshop on biosecurity for managers, park rangers and Navy officials. It was held in Ensenada and 36 people from all of the government agencies that are involved in island management were there. You see people from the Navy, the Secretary of Environment and Resources, the Commission on National Protected Areas and the CONAVIO. And we discussed the challenges and opportunities on implementing biosecurity. The challenges are many, but we are optimists, so we carry on working. So afterwards, we started working on me building Mexico's national island biosecurity program. We decided on a bottom-up strategy because we believe that by involving all stakeholders, and especially the community, from the beginning, they will own the project and it will be easier um, and more likely for them to adopt the habits they need to prevent introductions of invasive species. And we want to, we are creating protocols, biosecurity protocols that are specific for each island and it's characteristics and uses. We are also um, creating biosecurity committees which are part of each protected area advisory council. The councils are comprised of researchers, managers and representatives from the economic sector, so fishermen and tourist operators. And they are involved in all of the decisions involving the protected areas. So they are also involved in creating and formulating the biosecurity protocols and they'll be in charge of the implementation and the evaluation of the protocols. We also hope they'll, they'll be procuring funding for biosecurity in the long run. So, what have we achieved? So far, we have, after around 20 workshops, um, we have six drafts under review by the biosecurity committees and the governmental agencies involved with specific prevention measures. So through these workshops, we talked to the community, especially the fishermen and the tourist operators that visit some of the islands frequently, and we, found the critical control points where we should prioritize our efforts, whether for prevention on, or early detection. And we are designing the protocols so that um, they would be easily read and understood, and also so that the government agencies know which part they should implement, and also for the people. So socializing the protocols is a very important part in order for them to be implemented. So we've designed different material, such as this signage, which we have put both on mainland and on the islands, whenever, uh, where people land. And so we hope that people are following the prevention measures they all have this kind of um, blue and yellow design and we now see that um, they are um, identifying these colors with biosecurity. So we are hoping that's good. Informal implementation of biosecurity is underway. Um, we see especially by the communities and it's mostly for the early detection devices we have set on the islands and the communities are regularly checking on them and whenever we visit the island we also uh, check on them. But especially for prevention, we see that we have a 
more informed society that has learned they have to raise the alarm whenever they suspect of an incursion. And so that happened, for example, in Arrecife Alacranes, when the, a Navy officer saw a, a bar of soap that had little bites on it. So they immediately told CONAMP, who contacted us, and we were able to get there quick enough and do our um, response plan and caught the first, the only rat on the first night. So we are now sure there are no more rats on the island. So we have learned a lot. First of all, we need to institutionalize our biosecurity program. It's very important to sign agreements with the government in order for the program to um, be formally implemented and, and so that people know they have to comply. Um, it's also better to involve the Protected Area Advisory Council from the beginning um, and they push the government agencies to institutionalize the program. Straightforward communication between stakeholders is most important for a rapid response plan. And we need permanent environmental learning campaigns and we hope we, to do them with local organizations so that whenever we leave the communities, someone is there still um, spreading the word around biosecurity. A lot of people is involved in our projects and we are thankful to them all. Thank you. Uh, got time for one or two quick questions. Anyone's got a question for Mary? Up in the corner, if you can just wait for the microphone, please. There's a microphone. Just a couple of rows up. Hi. Uh, do you have the requirement for biosecurity protocols to be included in any procurement contracts you do? We are trying to get them to. Um, biosecurity is part of the protected areas management um, programs and we are pushing to make them more specific. Right now it only states like there should not be any introductions so we are trying to make them more specific. We are also trying to create for example with the tourist operators some kind of certificate so that if they comply with biosecurity measures, they have some sort of recognition, you know? Um, but we are still working on, on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Marion. That's great. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Uh, and now we're going to move up the coast a little further to the Channel Islands. And uh, Christy Boza from TNC. Mm -hmm. Are you Christy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and talk to us about biosecurity and the channel lines. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks for staying for the last talk of the day. And of all things, I'm talking to you about compliance permitting. So hopefully, I'll get you, get you out of here pretty quickly. Um, but uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors as well as the organizations that have been working with us on this program. Uh, to give you a reference point, I mostly work on the California and Channel Islands. Oh, wow. Are which are eight islands located off the coast of Southern California, owned by the National Park Service, uh, private conservancies, and the US Navy. Uh, it's the home of the first rat eradication in the US, uh, which Greg talked about, uh, conducted in the year 2000, as well as a number of other eradications of vertebrates that have occurred, um, invertebrates and plants. Uh, and something to note is that some of those eradications have been quite controversial. Um, I believe we were taken to court nine times uh, over a pig eradication uh, and turkey eradication, as well as uh, some controversy over the rat eradication. So this is located, we're located in a community that really does pay attention to what, ha what is happening on these islands. Um, and we've staked our reputation on the efficacy of the eradications that have occurred. Um, and there's, there's a good reason for them to pay attention. There's a lot of, of really interesting, amazing, endemic, uh, rare species on these islands, including the Channel Islands fox, which was recently taken off the endangered species list in August of last year. Uh, also, we re reintroduced bald gills to the island about two decades ago. 
Uh, we have the only insular endemic uh, bird species in North America, the island scrub jay, as well as native mice, uh, skunks, a bunch of other species, all of which are really, really cool, amazing animals, but also um, many of them are or would be impacted by rodenticide, and we would have to consider non-target effects um, if we were to ever do any kind of other rodent eradication or control effort. Um, we did institute a, a biosecurity program primarily based within the California Channel Islands archipelago. Uh, started formally in 2012 uh, with all of the land owning ent entities as well as a number of the island contractors, island users, folks that really have put their heart and soul into uh, protection of the islands. And there's a number of things that we're doing focused on prevention. Uh, including hiring a biosecurity manager, uh, which is jointly, uh, she's jointly paid by the land uh, owning entities uh, to primarily focus on prevention, uh, control of species before they go out to the island. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is kind of the other side of it, the side we have less control over right now, which is uh, you know, the potential for rats to come on a rat-free island due to a, a grounding, a ship grounding, or ship sinking, or some other, some other mode of transport. Most of the time, this, this happens. It happens a couple times a year. It happens literally as I was sitting in the airport waiting to come over here. I get this text message about a sailboat. So um, this happens very frequently. We get small, small boats that come onto the island because people have fall asleep at the wheel. Um, we have, uh, literally, and uh, we have uh, response kits available on each of the islands, uh, which can be deployed uh, if and when this happens. Uh, they're also with the Coast Guard and salvage companies. Most of these boats are very small, and it's unlikely there's a rat on them. In that case, you put out a rat kit. It's got some rat bait and a rat trap. Um, probably very, very unlikely there'd be any impacts to non-target species by putting out those bait stations on a boat that was grounded. <laughs> However, what we're really concerned about is this sucker, right? So we have uh, shipping lanes that are, go right through the middle of our channel. There are very large boats that, that come by. Um, so potentially, we could be dealing with a situation where a large ship that is very likely to have a rat on board may crash in or sink um, close to one of our islands. Our islands are pretty large and our rat free islands are pretty large. Um, like I said, this is a community that's very invested in these islands. They're rugged islands. There's lots of you know, vegetation. Uh, any kind of response to, uh, to any kind of rat incursion would be difficult. Uh, certainly an island-wide eradication on Santa Cruz Island would probably be impossible if not for logistical reasons, then for socio-political reasons. So, uh, we, about five years ago, we started intensively investigating what to do about this situation. We started talking with agencies to try to figure out how we could proactively permit a rat response. And uh, essentially, there's, there's emergency response planning out there if, if the action was to hurt humans or human property, which we can't really claim in this case. Um, there's another example of an oil spill response plan. So oil spills do happen. Uh, off our coast, and uh, we do work with, uh, you know, the community works together to pull together a very quick emergency response to an oil spill. Uh, an oil spill is very similar to a potential rat incursion in that we don't know when it's going to happen, we don't know where it's going to happen. So these permitting responses have to be very well thought out. A lot of um, mitigation measures need to be accounted for, a lot of contingency planning needs to occur. Um, and be agreed upon prior to that event happening. We know from work that y'all have conducted uh, that if a rat was to come onto the island um, via shipwreck, most likely um, would only have a high confidence that it would be in that site for maybe 48 hours, right? Um, permitting takes absolutely years, years and years and years. So we know that if there was a rat spill on the island, uh, similar to an oil spill, um, if there was a rat spill on the island, we would have probably just a few days to take action. So we are doing proactive permitting to be able to rapidly respond to an incursion if it should happen. This is just a list of all the rules that we'll have to follow and all the permits we would have to obtain before taking action of any significant size. Um, 
We looked at a number of uh, considerations in our compliance uh, review, which is actually ongoing. Uh, we needed to look at all of the sensor, sensitive natural resources for the entire archipelago, um, how people are using those sites, how seasonality might impact our potential actions that we might take, uh, and the mitigation measures that we would take, again, depending on what's there and, and what time of year it is. So this is what we've been, we've been looking at this, doing a lot of research. This document is quite large because it encompasses a lot of information. Um, rather than being a typical, you know, specific plan, we need to plan for a million different possibilities here. Um, a tool that we found to be very helpful is a, is a flow chart. Um, just tr quickly outlining if this, then this. Um, because again, if a Ratsville uh, shipwreck was to happen, if we think it's likely a rat is on board the island, we would need to make a decision about what actions to take very quickly um, and actually make a recommendation to the decision makers, which that person would then say go or no go. So, uh, so this flowchart hopefully uh, will be agreed to by all agencies, all parties, prior to any event happening. And at that point, we'd be able to, again, make a recommendation very quickly as to what tools should be used. Another component of this document, um, which took us a while to figure out, is that we need to, we need to have every single possible action um, analyzed in this document, from just putting out cameras, because maybe it's too risky to do anything else, to maybe full-on rodenticide you know, broadcasting uh, of an affected area. Um, so depending on what site it is, your supposed treatment area where you might want to treat, the assessment of the, the resources in that site, you, this flowchart would then help you direct you to a recommendation to be made in terms of the action that you would take. Uh, obvious, point of, uh, obvious point to note is that we need to have all of the storage of any um, baits, any cameras, any tools we want to use, would have to have them stored. Um, in an accessible site prior to this happening. So again, you could act within 48 hours, not two weeks later when the bait comes in from across the country. Um, so this is our little storage area where we might, for instance, be storing two tons of rodenticide. Um, but again, uh, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of thought that went into this, uh, has gone into this planning process, and there's a lot more work to do. Um, ultimately, we, we know there's a lot of cool species on the island. Uh, we also are cognizant that even if we have the ability to act, even if we have the ability to save broadcast rodenticide, we really need to think carefully about whether that's the right course of action for us and for our island. Um, potentially there are new tools on the horizon, potentially there are uh, species specific tools coming up in the next decade or so. Um, right now on, on these islands, there's actually no indication that uh, while rats would have an impact on species, we probably wouldn't see necessarily complete eradication of native species due to rat presence on the island. So we might actually make the call to say, no, we're not going to do anything. We're going to wait until there's a better tool. Um, we're going to you know, save, um, save face with the public so that when we get a better tool, we will do an island eradication, a full-on island eradication, rather than just doing a rapid response action. That's certainly a possibility. It's something that we're building into our thinking as we plan this. However, I still think that this proactive permitting exercise that we've done is, or are doing, is very, very helpful because I think we can all think of a number of situations where proactive planning um, is, is really, really crucial for our success. Moreover, um, I would say that if, um, for instance, if um, this, this, this thing was to happen, um, just having the groundwork um, where we can bring in new tools having the relationships with the agencies so they understand that proactive permitting for environmental reasons and not just for emergency response reasons is, is actually valuable. I think that's, that's really important. We've built relationships with folks in Alaska, Hawaii, and California so that these permitting agencies are getting used to the idea that emergency response can be for environmental reasons, not just to protect human health. Um, if I got two minutes, I'm going to talk about my favorite subject, which is ants. So my point here is that so Argentine ants are an uh, um, invasive species we've been working to eradicate on Santa Cruz Island. There was no effective bait available in the US. We created our own using low toxicant, um, low toxicant uh, hydrated with sugar water and these little beads. And these little beads are made out of polyacrylamide, which is plastic. 
And we spent years thinking about how we can make this bait, how we could try to get rid of ants. And ultimately, it was not perfect, because if we were going to deploy this bait in a landscape, each one of those little plastic beads is a bait station. We're essentially talking about putting out plastic throughout 100 or about a little over 400 hectares of the island. It wasn't a perfect solution, but we decided there was nothing else on the horizon that made sense. We didn't want the ants to spread, so we went ahead and did it. Um, because we demonstrated success, because it looks like it was going real well, uh, folks at UC Riverside have created a seaweed-based biodegradable bead. So doing the exact same thing, um, they're in the trial phases right now, but hopefully we'll be able to do the exact same thing and really move uh, invasive ant eradication technology forward. And we never would have been able to do that if we hadn't made that leap to say it's not perfect, but it's good enough, we're gonna demonstrate success, and other people are gonna take it and run with it and make it better. Um, so back to, I think, Greg's point um, that he made at the, the beginning, I think sometimes incremental success is actually necessary, especially when the science is in its infancy. And I would say, my opinion is that uh, uh, insect eradication biology um, is really in, in its infancy, and we need every single tool we can get to be able to scale up um, and make that program better. So even though the compliance document is not perfect, we might decide to change a whole bunch of it. At least we're introducing the idea of, of that proactive uh, compliance permitting with agencies so that tool can be utilized even as we pull in new tools and create new tools for the future. Thank you. Question? I've got one. Um, okay. Do you, how do you plan to your clever flow diagram? Yes. How do you plan to maintain that with the benefit of experience and changes in technology and um, things? Yeah, I think that's what I was getting at with, in terms of saying this isn't perfect because once it, once this document is finalized, it's finalized. Um, so there's not going to be a lot of room for interpretation or, you know, maneuvering after the fact. That's why we're trying to be as thoughtful ahead of time right now to build in as much flexibility as possible in the plan. Um, that being said, these environmental compliance documents are, um, are in some ways uh, changeable. I think there'd be a rough uh, interpretation that we could probably uh, amend through time. Um, I certainly sometimes uh, we want the document to hold up in court for sure, but I think that no matter what, um, there's, we're gonna have to make the document so it's loose enough that it can be interpreted in multiple ways. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Christy, and thanks to all the speakers, and uh, it's been quite a stimulating uh, session this afternoon.